Galen. Uh, there it again. Uh, we're going to read another chapter from Peter Pan and Wendy. And this time it's chapter two and it's called The Shadow. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the last story and I hope you enjoy this one as well. If you're not ready, get nice and cosy and then it's time to go to sleep. Chapter two, The Shadow. Mrs. Darling screamed and as if in an answer to a bell, the door opened and Nana entered, returned from her evening out. She growled and sprang at the boy, who leapt lightly through the window. Again, Mrs. Darling screamed, this time in distress for him, for she thought he was killed, and she ran down into the street to look for this little body, but it was not there. And she looked up, and in the black night she could see nothing but what she thought was a shooting star. She returned to the nursery and found Nana with something in her mouth, which proved to be the boy's shadow. As he leapt at the window, Nana had closed it quickly, too late to catch him, but his shadow had not got out in time. Slam went the window and it snapped off. You may be sure Mrs. Darling examined the shadow carefully, but it was quite the ordinary kind of shadow. Nana had no doubt of what was the best thing to do with this shadow. She hung it out the window, meaning he is sure to come back for it. Let us put it where he can get it and easily without disturbing the children. But unfortunately, Mrs. Darling could not leave it hanging out at the window. It looked so like the washing and lowered the whole tone of the house. She thought of showing it to Mrs. Darling, but, Mr. Darling, sorry, but he was totting up winter great coats for John and Michael with a wet towel around his head to keep his brain clear, and it seemed a shame to trouble him. Besides, she knew exactly what he would say. It all comes of having a dog for a nurse. Poor Nana. She decided to roll the shadow up and put it away carefully in a drawer until a fitting opportunity came for telling her husband. Ah, me. The opportunity came a week later. On the never-to-be-forgotten Friday. Of course it was a Friday. I ought to have been specially careful on a Friday, she used to say afterwards to her husband, whilst perhaps Nana was on the other side of her, holding her hand. No, no, Mr. Darling always said. I am responsible for it all. I, George Darling, did it. Me culpa, me culpa. He had a classical education. They say thus night after night recalling the fatal Friday till every detail of it has, was stamped on their brains and came through on the other side like the faces on a bag of coins. If only I had not accepted the invitation to dine at number 27, Mr. Darling said. If only I had not poured my medicine into Nana's bowl, said Mr. Darling. If only I pretended to like the medicine, was what Nana's wet eyes said. My liking for parties, George, my fatal gift of humour, dearest. My touchiness about trifles, dear master and mistress. Then, one or more of them would break down together. Nana, at the thought. It's true, it's true. They ought not to have had a dog for a nurse. Many times it was Mr. Darling who put a handkerchief to Nana's eyes. That fiend, Mr. Darling would cry, and Nana's bark was the echo of it. But Mrs. Darling never upbraided Peter. There was something in the right-hand corner of her mouth that wanted her not to call Peter names. They would sit there in the empty nursery, recalling fondly every smallest detail of that dreadful evening. It had all begun so uneventful, so precisely like a hundred other evenings, with Nana putting on the water for Michael's bath and carrying him on her back. I won't go to bed, he said. Like one who still believes that he had the last word on the subject. I won't, I won't. Nana, it isn't even six o'clock yet. Oh dear, oh dear, I shan't love you any more, Nana. I tell you, I won't be baffed. I won't, I won't. Then Mrs. Darling had come in, 
wearing her white evening gown. She had dressed early because Wendy so loved to see her in her evening gown. With the necklace George had given her, necklace George had given her, she was wearing Wendy's bracelet on her arm. She had asked for the loan of it. Wendy loved to lend her bracelet to her mother. She had found her two other children playing at being herself and father on the occasion of Wendy's birth, and John was saying, I am happy to inform you, Mrs Darling, that you are now a mother, in just such a tone as Mr Darling himself may have used at the real occasion. Wendy had danced with joy, just as the real Mrs Darling must have done. Then John was born, with the extra pump that he received due to the birth of a male, and then Michael came with his bath to ask to be born also. But John said brutally that they did not want any more. No more kids. Please enough. Michael had nearly cried. Nobody wants me, he said. And of course, the lady in the evening dress could not stand that. I do, she said. I so want a third child. Boy or girl, asked Michael. Not too hopefully. Boy. Then he leapt into her arms. Such a little thing for Mr and Mrs Darling and Nana to recall now. But not so little if that was to be Michael's last night in the nursery. They go on with their recollections. It was then that I rushed in like a tornado, wasn't it? Mr Darling would say, scorning himself. And indeed, he had been like a tornado. Perhaps there was some excuse for him. He too had been dressing for the party and all had gone well with him until he came to his tie. It is an astonishing thing to have to tell, but this man, though he knew about stocks and shares, had no real mastery of his tie. Sometimes the thing he yielded to him without contest, but there were occasions when it would have been better for the house if he had swallowed his pride and used a made-up tie. This was such an occasion. He came rushing into the nursery with his cramped little brute of a tie in his hand. Why, what is the matter, father dear? Matter? he yelled. He really yelled. This tie! It will not die! She became dangerously sarcastic. Not round my neck, round the bedpost? Oh yes, twenty times have I made it up around the bedpost. But around my neck? No. Oh dear, no. Begs to be excused. He thought Mrs Darling was not sufficiently impressed, and he went on sternly. I warn you of this, mother, that unless this tie is around my neck, we don't go out to dinner tonight. And if I don't go out to dinner tonight, I never go to the office again. And if I don't go to the office again, you and I starve. And our children, flung on the street. Even then, Mrs Darling was placid. Let me try, dear, she said. And indeed, that was what he had come to ask her to do. And with his nice cool hands, with her nice cool hands, she tied his tie for him, whilst the children stood around to see their fate decided. Some men would have resented her being able to do it so easily, but Mr Darling had far too fine a nature for that. He thanked her, carelessly, at once forgot his rage. Sorry, he thanked her, carelessly, at once forgot his rage, and in another moment was dancing around the room with Michael on his back. How wildly we romp, said Mr. says Mrs Darling, now recalling it. Our last romp, Mr Darling groaned. Oh, George, do you remember Michael suddenly said to me, How did you get to me to know me, mother? I remember. They were rather sweet, don't you think, George? And they were ours, ours, and now they're gone. The romp had ended with the appearance of Nana, and most unluckily, Mr Darling collided against her, covering his trousers with dog hair. They were not only new trousers, but they were the first he had ever had with braids on them, and he had to bite his lip to prevent the tears coming. Of course, Mrs Darling brushed him. But he began to talk about it being a mistake to have a dog for a nurse. George, Nana is a treasure. No doubt, but I have an uneasy feeling at times that she looks upon the children as puppies. Oh no, dear ones. I feel sure she knows they have souls. I wonder, Mr Darling said thoughtfully, I wonder. It was an opportunity, his wife felt, for telling him about the boy. 
At first, he pooh pooed the story, but he became thoughtful when she showed him the shadow. It is nobody's I know, he said, examining it carefully, but it does look a scoundrel. We were still discussing it, you remember, said Mr. Darling, when Nana came in with Michael's medicine. You will never carry the bottle in yours again, Nana, in your mouth again, Nana, and it's all my fault. Strong man though he was, there is no doubt that he had behaved rather foolishly over the medicine. If he had a weakness, it was for thinking that all of this had been taken all, all, uh, all his life he had taken medicine boldly. And so now, when Michael dodged the spoon in Nana's mouth, he had said reprivingly, Be a man, Michael. Won't, won't, Michael cried naughtily. Mrs. Darling left, left the room to get a chocolate for him, and Mr. Darling, though his showed, thought his showed want of firmness. Mother, don't pamper him, he called after her. Michael, when I was your age, I took medicine without a murmur. I said, thank you, kind parents, for giving me the bottles to make me well. He really thought this was true, and Wendy, who was now in her nightgown, believed it also, she said, to encourage Michael. That medicine you sometimes take, father, is much nastier, isn't it? Ever so much nastier, Mr. Darling said bravely. And I would take it now, as an example to you, Michael, if I hadn't lost the bottle. He had not exactly lost it. He had climbed in the dead of night to the top of the wardrobe and hidden it there. What he did not know was that the faithful Eliza had found it and put it back to the washstand. I know where it is, father, Wendy cried, always glad to be of service. I'll bring it. And she was off before he could stop her. Immediately, his spirits sank in the strangest way. John, he said, shuddering. It's most beastly stuff. It's that nasty, sticky, sweet kind. I have been as quick as I could, she panted. You have been wonderfully quick, her father resorted with a vindictive politeness that was quite thrown up away upon her. Michael first, he said, doggedly. Father first, said Michael, who was of a suspicious nature. I shall be sick, you know, Mr. Darling said, frettingly. Come on, father, said John. Hold your tongue, John, his father roared out, rapped out. Wendy was quite puzzled. I, I thought you took it quite easily, father. That is not the point, he resorted. The point is that there is more in my glass than in Michael's spoon. His proud heart was nearly bursting. And it isn't fair, I would say, it though it were my last breath. It just isn't fair. Father, I'm waiting, said Michael coldly. It's all very well to say you're waiting. So am I waiting. Father's a cowardly castard, so you're a cowardly castard. Oh, sorry. Father's a cowardly castard. So are you a cowardly castard. I'm not frightened. Oh, well, neither am I frightened. Well, then take it. Well, then you take it. Wendy had a splendid idea. Why not both take it at the same time? Certainly, said Mr. Darling. Are you ready, Michael? Wendy gave the word. One. Two, three, and Michael took his medicine, but Mr. Darling slipped his behind his back. There was a yell of rage from Michael, and oh, father, Wendy explained. What do you mean by oh, father, Mr. Darling demanded. Stop that now, Michael. I meant to take mine, but I, uh, I missed it. I missed it. It was dreadful the way that all the three were looking at him just as if they did not admire him. Look here, all of you, he said, entertainingly, as soon as Nana had gone into the bathroom. I have just thought of a splendid joke. I shall pour my medicine into Nana's bowl and she will drink it, thinking it's milk. It was the colour of milk, but the children did not have their father's sense of humour and they looked at him reproachfully as he poured the medicine into Nana's bowl. Ha! What fun! 
he said doubtfully, and they did not dare expose him when Mrs. Darling and Nana returned. Nana, good dog, he said, patting her. I have put a little milk into your bowl, Nana. Nana wagged her tail, ran to the medicine and began lapping it up. Then she gave Mr. Darling such a look, but not an angry look. She showed him the great red teeth that makes us so sorry for noble dogs and then crept into her kennel. Mr. Darling was frightfully ashamed of himself, but he would not give in. In a horrid silence, Mrs. Darling smelt the bowl. Oh, George, she said, it's your medicine. It was a joke, he roared, while she comforted his, her boys. And Wendy hugged Nana. Much good, he said bitterly. My wearing myself to the bones trying to be funny in this house. And still Wendy hugged Nana. That's right, he shouted. Coddle her. Nobody coddles me. Oh dear, no. I am the only breadwinner. Why should I be coddled? Why, why, why? George, Mrs. Darling entreated him. Not so loud. The servants will hear. Will hear you. Somehow they had got into the way of calling Lisa the servant. Servants? Let them, he answered recklessly. Bring in the whole world. But I refuse to allow that dog to lord in my nursery for an hour longer. The children wept, and Nana ran to him beseechingly. But he waved her back. He felt he was a strong man again. In vain, in vain, he cried. The proper place for you is in the yard, and there you go to be tied up this instant. George, George, Miss Darling whispered. Remember what I told you about that boy. Alas, he would not listen. He was determined to show who was the master in the house. And when commands would not be drawn, would not draw Nana from the kennel, he lured her out of it with honeyed words and seized her roughly, dragged her from the nursery. He was ashamed of himself, but yet he did it. It was all owing to his too affectionate, affectionate nature, which craved for admiration. When he had tied her up in the backyard, the wretched father went and sat in the passage with his knuckles to his eyes. In the meantime, Mr. Dar Mrs. Darling had put the children to bed in unwanted silence and lit the night lights. They could hear Nana barking, and John whimpered. It is because he's he's chaining her up in the yard. But Wendy was wiser. That is not Nana's unhappy bark, she said, little guessing what was about to happen. That is her bark when she smells danger. Danger? Are you sure, Wendy? Oh, yes. Mrs. Darling quivered and went to the window. It was securely fastened. She looked out and the night was peppered with stars. They were crowding around the house as if curious to see what was to take place there. But she did not notice this, nor that. One or two of the smaller ones winked at her. Yet a nameless fear clutched at her heart and made her cry. Oh, how I wished that I wasn't going to a party tonight. Even Michael, already half asleep, knew that this was perpetual. And he asked, Can anything harm us, mother, after the night lights are lit? Nothing, precious, she said. They are the eyes of a mother that she leaves behind to guard her children. She went from bed to bed, singing enchantments over them. And little Michael flung his arms around her. Mother, he cried, I'm glad of you. They were the last words she was to hear from him for a long time. Number 27 was only a few yards distance, but there had been a slight fall of snow. And father and mother darling picked their way over it, deftly not to soil their shoes. They were already the only persons in the street, and all the stars were watching them. Stars are beautiful, but they may not take an active part in anything. They may just look on forever. It is punishment put on them for something they did so long ago that no stars know what it was. So the older ones have become glass-eyed and seldom speak, winking in their star language. But the little ones 
still wonder. They are not really friendly to Peter, who had a mischievous way of stealing up behind them and trying to blow them out. But they are so fond of fun that they were on his side at two night, anxious to get the grown-ups out of the way. So, as soon as the door number 27 closed, Mr and Mrs Darling there were a commotion of firmness, and the smallest of all the stars in the Milky Way screamed out, Now, Peter! And that's the end of that chapter. In the next chapter, I think we're going to actually meet Peter Pan, and I think he's going to try and get his shadow back. If you're not ready, it's time to go to sleep. Okay, night-night. Love you.